there seem to be two different philosophies of building a company. One is more your Eric Ries, lean startup philosophy, and the other one seems to be your Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel zero to one philosophy. Which one is better and why? Oh, wow. <laughs> I think, for me, I think they're the same thing, but just different stages. Like, early on, you're just trying to figure it out, and over time, you're trying to build that into a quote-unquote monopoly. Um, so, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the lean startup approach. Um, I think that uh, you don't want to build a very high cost structure until you've convinced yourself that you've got the right product and it's time to step on the gas. That, that's basically, in a nutshell, what lean startup is all about. Um, and, and so I, I encourage everybody to approach business that way. The, the problem you have is if you get your cost structure too high and you haven't got the product right, you inevitably end up in this situation where you can't get another round of financing done and, and, and then you're screwed. Um, so keep, keep your costs low until you get, you get it figured out and you can avoid that problem. Thank you. Um, so I noticed that both of you have like background in engineering, and afterwards for Fry you got an MBA from Wharton School. So I'm just wondering, like for students such as me who have a business background but are extremely passionate about going to the startup world, what what be, what would be your advice for us who have business skills but doesn't necessarily have the technical skills in engineering or building a product? Uh, I think. Find a, a business partner who 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 has uh, you know complementary skills to what you have. Uh, some you know if if you're really strong in marketing or finance or operations, find somebody who is weak in those areas but's really strong in product or engineering. I think two founder teams are great. Um, it's hard to find uh, somebody who has enough skills that they can do it all themselves. It happens. Um, but I, my, my, my recommendation would be find somebody to do a startup together who's a good complement to you. Um, my other advice would be like, you know, I get a lot like, hey, I'm really good at business, I'm looking for a technical co-founder. And it's like, everybody laughs like, yeah, everybody's looking for a technical co-founder. Um, I think the key thing for me, if, if I, like on the business side is, if you think you're really good at business, is find a technical co-founder who's working on a problem that you like and simply like offer to help them for free. Um, this is something like Peter did very well, is Peter's our CFO, COO today, and, and he started working with us three months in, and he's like, I like you, uh, I like what you're working on, like, I, like I'd love to just like help you. And it was like no commitment and nothing, and it was, and it was awesome, and, and today he's one of the largest shareholders of Kick. Um, so that would be like very practically my advice, is if you can't build it yourself and you wanna do a tech company, Find somebody who is somebody who is building it themselves in an area you like, and then just offer to help and prove prove your value to them. I think if I can sneak an answer in too, I think the other side of that is that most business people say, "I have an idea," and then the first step is, "I need to build it. I need a technical co-founder." And if you're going to be half as good as you're going to need to be to build a really great startup as a business person, you need to go out and hustle that and figure out that there's customers and talk to all of them and sell it before you have to build it. And then once you have that, finding a technical founder is so easy because you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, listen, here's the story. We've got this huge market. We've got this huge opportunity. You have to build this simple thing. You're a smart guy or a smart girl. I know you can figure it out. Let's do this together. And everybody will jump on that in comparison to this super vague, I've got an idea. Can you build it for me? Which means you sit there and do nothing while they do 60 hours a week building something for months to then find out that no one wants it. And, and so, like, if you ask of the residents, 70% of them are in engineering or math, that is what they get approached with all the time. And so if you're the business person, either as Ted said, go find somebody else who has an idea that you can help, or go and actually do the hustle ahead of time to prove this thing has legs, and then you'll have no trouble finding somebody. Uh, 
I was wondering if uh, both of you could give uh, your advice to our audience uh, on how entrepreneurs should think about valuations, especially when they're looking for their first round of investment, and how they should think about that in terms of uh, interacting with potential investors. So I, I have a very strong point of view on this. I, I actually don't think that valuations um, are the thing that you should be focused on. So I'll just give you two seconds on math. Most everybody probably knows this, but it'll help me make my point. Um, if you take the amount of money you need, let's call it a million dollars, and divide it by the amount of equity you have to sell to get it, let's call that 20%, then you have a $5 million valuation. I think the valuation is the thing that happens as a result of the transaction, but it's not what you should be solving for. And so here's, here, here's the advice I would give you. Never dilute more than 20% when you raise money and expect to dilute at least 10%. So think about diluting between 10 and 20% every time you raise money and never raise money that buys you less than 12 months of runway and don't dilute uh, don't raise more, more than 18 months of runway until you're like in your Series D or Series E when your valuation is so high that it doesn't cost you that much to raise 24 or 36 months of capital. Um, and so uh, what that means is practically if you need a half, a, if you need a, half a million dollars you know, be prepared to sell 10, maybe 15, hopefully not 20% of the company for that. And then you'll end up between two and a half million and five million dollars of valuation. But the two and a half to five million, it's not, it's not, it's not, doesn't mean anything really. It's just, it's the dilution and the runway. Those are the two things that matter. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's perfect. <laughs> My favorite line that I hear in the Bay Area all the time is, I'll let you set the valuation if I can set the rest of the terms. And I think that underscores it perfectly, that the valuation is just a function of what happens, but all the other terms uh, in that investment are way more important. Yeah. Well, and the most important is who's writing the check. Right? Like that's, you know, really, really important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully it's me. I think mine would bounce. Hey, so you were, so you were talking before about um, how at these companies like Uber and Lyft and Airbnb, B, Airbnb come about, um, we need to start regulating them. Um, however, government is one of the slowest bodies out there when it comes to decision making, while startups um, are one of the quickest. So how, do, and, and I'd assert that part of the lack of regulation around Uber and Lyft and Airbnb is because of that um, difference in speed. So how do you see, um, what, what do you think is the best way to amend that situation? Well, I definitely believe that you should not ask for permission as an entrepreneur. You should beg for forgiveness, right? So you should do the thing that you want to do, and when the regulator comes knocking on your door, you're like, oh, I didn't know I was breaking the law. You know, that's definitely the move. Um, <laughs> but you want to have, uh, if you're going to do that, and you know that eventually someone's going to come knocking on your door, um, I think it's important to surround yourself with advisors who will at least help you avoid breaking the law in the most egregious ways. I said something uh, a month or so ago on stage, and I'm going to try to remember what I said because I thought it was pretty good. It was like um, there are ways that you can break the law that are kind of like not too bad, and there are ways you can break the law that are really, really bad. And you should do the former, but don't do the latter, basically. Okay, we've only got time for two more questions. I think this is wonderful tonight. Ted, question, and this is true to Fred's heart, the teaching kids how to code. Strong, that's the future of the whole technology and maybe the future of the world. Kids that know how to build things, and it's not impossible to learn in high school, learn in public school. So, and Fred, you feel strongly about that. Ted, do you do that in Waterloo? Is there a program? I mean, these are all kids in university programming and doing great things, want to do startups. To the other person, the business person, you could teach yourself how to code. So do you do those things to help kind of nurture and give back to the community? And Fred, just a comment, in New York, you're doing wonderful work on that area. Has that changed in the last six months, 12 months, a year, two years? Are you getting any further in that development? Yeah, so that's something I, I we think a lot about. Um, not so much at the university level, like I think 
that's good. Uh, but at the high school level, uh, we sponsor um, some robotics teams, math teams, stuff like this. Um, but to me, the biggest thing that I think is missing is sort of the fun in coding. Like when I was in high school, I could code a game that was good as the best game available. It was like Snake or something. Um, whereas today, it's like, you know, I can only imagine if I were a kid, I code a game, and it's like Snake, and, I, and like I show it to my friends, they're like, why don't we just play Call of Duty? This is the worst game ever. <laughs> Um, so that's something I think about is like how do you bring the like fun and the spark back into like creating something in high school or middle school? Uh, something I actually talked to uh, Code Academy is a big um, USV portfolio company. I talked to Zach, who's the CEO there. Like we're we're starting to think about like we have all these youth on Kick as a chat platform, and we have all these official accounts getting built, where you can actually build something pretty cool pretty easily. Um, so could we could we teach our user base to code those? Uh, so that's something we think a lot about. Well, you know what's, what's interesting about that is that the, um, the number one thing right now that's driving young people, and I say young people, I'm thinking about like 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds into coding is they want to mod their Minecrafts, right? That's the thing. And so what you're talking about is letting people mod kick. Same basic idea. That's, that's really cool. I, the other thing that I think is important about this is not just coding. Coding's maybe the easiest thing to talk about, but it's robotics and it's um, making 3D models and making virtual reality experiences and hacking hardware, using Arduino. Like there's all these things that are out there um, that make it easy for young people to make things. And Ted told me that he really got into engineering through robotics, is that right? Yeah. I spent all of high school building first robots. And I was like, I want to build robots, we're going to do that. Oh, mechatronics engineering? Yeah, we get to build robots all day, that'd be great. Little did I know robotics engineering has nothing to do with building robots, it's all math. But by then they had me, so. <laughs> you know, the, the, the woman who helped me start a computer science high school in New York City, her name is Leanne, um, said the first thing that I do with students who've never written a line of code before is we um, basically build robots and we instruct robots. And I said, well, why do you do that? Why do you start with that? And she said, coding is an abstract thing and the thing you have to learn is that the first uh, code that you write isn't gonna work and then you have to debug it. And the best way to teach somebody that is to have them instruct a robot like go down this and then turn right and go through the door and inevitably the robot doesn't turn right and smashes into the wall and they realize, oh, my program doesn't work, now I gotta go back and fix it. And that physical, like real instantiation of the fact that they gotta debug their code is great and they learn it quickly. So it's that whole thing, like we call it coding because you gotta call it something, but I think of it as like kind of engineering really, it's modern engineering I guess in a sense using advanced technology and that's the thing that I, I just think we need to be way, way more aggressive at um, giving that, those experiences to our kids. Okay, last question. Okay, um, so you joke that, you, that as a VC you don't, ha or you don't work very hard or don't have a lot to do, but I gotta believe that you have a ton that you're doing every day, yet you still find a lot of time to blog and to, to do a lot of writing. How do you, A, find the time to do that, and two, find all the topics that you write about? Well, I write about the things that interest me. And I write, um, it, it's a very, it's really actually quite a selfish act. I write because I need, to, the way my mind works, I need to, um, I need to, I need to go through the mental process of, constructing an argument or a opinion or, or some sort of thing that, that then I put out there. Um, and, and so all of the investment ideas that, that we work on at Union Square Ventures and that I've worked on um, have come from the writing that I do. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's just a process for me. Now, I get, there's a lot of other things that come from it, but that's really where it starts. Um, and uh, uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't get there from just reading. Like, I'm sure there's a lot of people who can, um, but that's not how my mind works. I've gotta go through the extra step of, of, of putting it in my own words and putting it on paper 
And then, and, and then the act of making it public is important because um, that you're not gonna put something out there unless you're at least quasi comfortable with it, right? So it's another hurdle that I gotta get through in order to hit that publish button. And so that's really why I do it.